Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at sedimentary environments and sedimentary rocks. So now we're going to start thinking about why do sedimentary sequences consist of layers and this is going to correspond to section 7.7 .7 of your textbook. So the vast majority of sediments will be deposited as layers, and these layers will often have what's referred to as a sheet-like morphology. So the layer itself will be quite laterally extensive, but compared to its total width, the layer will actually be quite thin. And so this would give it a, a, a 3D appearance, something similar to a sheet of paper, for instance. Now, obviously, we're going to have layers deposited on top of other layers, and so we're going to build up a stack of layers of sediment, one on top of another. And this is often referred to as a sequence or a stratigraphic sequence. So if we look at our images here, we can see two images. In this particular image at the top, you can see we have layers which are quite big. So if we look in particular, we can see we have a situation where this layer at the top, which is weathering to this darker finish, it consists of one solid layer which is all the same rock. Now underneath it we have a sequence where we have uh, obviously finer layers which make up this total sequence right here and you can see the difference because of the difference in textures. Now over here on the other hand we have a sequence that consists of lots and lots of thinner layers. Now each one of these thin layers if it's thicker than one centimeter is referred to as a bed. If the layer is less than one centimeter, it's referred to as a lamination. So obviously these layers that we can see in the sequence here are beds because they're definitely greater than one centimeter in thickness because we can clearly see them in the image. Now over here we have this layer which is very, very thick and we have this sequence of rocks here which consists of multiple thin layers but they all appear to be the same rock type which would suggest they're all being deposited in the same environment or at least a similar environment. So what we can do in this situation is we can say, right, well, this is a very, ex you know, very thick and probably quite laterally extensive layer. And as long as the layer has defined lower and upper margin, so we can see the top and the bottom of the layer, we can define this very, very thick layer as a formation. And what we can also do is we can look at this sequence below and once again we can see there's quite a sharp boundary there at the top. And although we can't see it, there's probably also a sharp boundary at the bottom. In fact, this might be it here in the foreground right there. And so once again, we, you know, I believe that these layers of uh, these beds of sediment here were probably deposited in the same environment. And so we would also classify this sequence of layers as a formation as well. So beds are essentially the building blocks of a sedimentary sequence, so each layer of sediment will produce one bed, providing that bed is greater than one centimetre in thickness. If it's less than one centimetre, we call it a lamination. What we can do, though, is if the beds are particularly thick, or if we have multiple beds that have all been formed in the same environment, we can combine those together and we put them into a unit which we call a formation. And this makes life easier for geologists because by putting them in the formation, we're essentially saying, right, these rock layers all formed in the same kind of environment. And so that helps to you know, explain what we're looking at. Rather than having to worry about each individual bed, we can look at a whole sequence of beds and we can say, right, they all formed in the same way. So we're just going to lump them together and call them the you know, such and such formation. So in terms of the boundaries that occur between beds, they can essentially occur in a couple of ways. We have what are referred to as gradational boundaries, and we have what are referred to as sharp boundaries. So the names are relatively uh, self-explanatory. In the case of a sharp boundary, you can see the boundary between beds of rock is crisp. It's very, very clear to see. So as we cross from one bed to another, what's actually happening? Well, the change from one bed of rock to another bed of rock is typically marked by at least one of three variables. So there can be a change in color. There can be a change in composition, so what are the layers made from? And there can be a change in class size. So in this particular instance, we have what appears to be a sandstone down here, and it looks like there's a conglomerate that's been deposited over the top. So what can we see? Well, we can quite clearly see there's a change in color, and that's the first thing we'll notice. But there is obviously also a change in class size. This layer down here consists of sand size class, whereas this layer up here clearly consists of class that are in the gravel to cobble range. So we not only have a change in color, but we also have a change 
in the class size. And the final thing is, is there a change in composition? Well, yes, this appears to be a, a muddy looking sandstone here, whereas this conglomerate appears to consist of class from multiple different sources. So for instance, we have this class here, has a kind of creamy white yellow color to it. This class here has a kind of light gray color to it. And this class here has a black color to it, which would suggest they're coming from different rocks. So that would suggest the class are coming in from different locations. And so in this instance, we can actually see we have all of the three variables changing as we cross from this layer to this layer. So once again, that's a change in color, a change in grain size, or a change in composition. Now, the reason the boundary is sharp is because it essentially marks out a, you know, a, a change in the environment of deposition. So something is changing in the system, and that change is so abrupt that it, you can see it as a nice, crisp contact in the sequence. So down here we have what appears to be a slightly muddy sandstone. It, it's always difficult to you know, work out exactly what environment this was forming in. So for argument's sake, let's just say this is a delta sandstone maybe. And then obviously there has been some kind of change in the environment. So in this case, and just looking at the contact and looking how it undulates, it appears that this may well be an erosional surface. So it looks like this muddy sandstone here was deposited as a sediment, then it was lithified and turned into a rock. It was uplifted, so it was above sea level. It was eroded, and this erosion went and produced this uneven surface that we can see here. And then, later on, the conglomerate was deposited over the top. So you can see that this is obviously going to produce this nice sharp contact that we can see. Now, not all contacts which are sharp are erosional, but in this instance that would appear to be the situation. Now in terms of gradational boundaries, these show a steady change in the environment. So if you remember, once again, the sharp boundary represents a marked change in the environment. So we're moving from a, the kind of environment that deposits a sand here to the kind of environment that deposits a conglomerate here. In the case of the gradational boundary, we're going to see a steady change in either colour, class size or composition. So what we can see here in this sequence is we can see down at the bottom we have lots of very, very finely bedded mudstones which have a slightly grey colour to them. And then all of a sudden we have this thick layer coming through here which is going to be a sandstone. Then we're back to mudstones again. Then we have another sandstone. And then you'll notice as we keep going up the amount of mudstones is, dis is decreasing, the amount of sand is increasing until we get up to the top where our layer is almost nothing but sand. So you can see we have a steady change as we're going up through our sequence. We have more muddy sediments down here. As we go up, the amount of mud decreases, but the amount of sand increases. So you can see we have this gradational change. And we can see this by a change in colour, because we're going from grey down here to this kind of tan colour up here. We can also, we'll also see it as a change of composition because we're going from muddier sediments down here to sandier sediments down here. And obviously that's also going to be reflected in a change in grain size. We're obviously going to have clay and silt sized class down here and sand sized class up here. But the most important thing to remember is that this gradational boundary shows you that there has been a steady change as you move from one depositional environment to another. So the variation between a sharp change, which will give us a sharp boundary, and a gradational change, which will give us a gradational boundary, helps to explain why we have these two distinct types of boundary within sedimentary sequences. So in terms of bedding, the vast majority of sedimentary bedding is what we refer to as parallel bedding. And we can see that here quite nicely. We have numerous layers, or beds of rock, which are all running parallel to each other. And you know, that's the way that the vast majority of sediments will appear within a sedimentary sequence. But there are a couple of examples of bedding which are quite distinct. So the first type of bedding which is quite distinct is something which you refer to as cross bedding. So for this particular instance, we're going to look at this layer of rock right here, okay? So we have the bottom marked right there. So the top of this layer of rock is right here, and the bottom is right here. So it extends from here up to here. You'll notice, though, that this layer of rock has these diagonal beds coming across it, doesn't it? These are cross beds. And cross beds are formed by dunes. So they're a sedimentary texture which we would tend to get in environments like deserts or the dune sands behind a beach. So you're obviously wondering, well, how do these cross beds actually form? Well, if we look at this diagram here, we can see here is our dune marked out as this black line. Now, sand 
is being pushed by the wind up this side of the dune here and this side of the dune is referred to as the stoss. So the sand gets pushed up the stoss side of the dune and it will begin to pile up at the dune's crest. Eventually you will have so much sand located here at the dune's crest that that sand will become unstable and it will slump down the front of the dune. This is the front of the dune is the side that we call the lee. So sand is coming up the stoss and being deposited down the lee. And this will happen again and again. So more sand will get pushed up, it will gather at the crest of the dune, and then eventually once there's enough of it, it will slump down the front of the dune. And so you can see in this diagram here, you can see here's one slump, followed by another slump, followed by another slump. And each one of these slumps is going to produce one individual cross bed, which is what we can see here. And so the presence of the cross beds tells us we have dunes, but of course it also tells us which way the dune is moving. So the dune is taking sand from its back and it's depositing it at its front. So our dune in this model is going from the left to the right. So the angle or the direction of the angle of the cross bed tells you the direction of travel. So in this case, we can see the cross beds are going top left to bottom right. So we can see here in this instance, here we go, top left to bottom right. And so this is telling us that the dune that created these cross beds was coming from this side of the picture and it was moving towards the right. And so this tells us about the prevailing wind in that particular environment, which once again is a wonderful piece of evidence to have as a geologist. Now, the next type of bedding that we can sometimes come across is graded bedding. And graded bedding is similar to a graded boundary. It's just a steady change in color, composition or grain size. So think of a situation where we have a river and our river is getting ready to flood. And so when the water leaves the river, it has lots of energy. So it becomes flooding out of the river. And because it has energy, it can transport a range of class sizes. So it can transport clays, it can transport silts, and it can transport sands. The problem is, as soon as the water leaves the river and starts spreading out over the floodplain, it starts to slow down. And as it starts to slow down, it loses energy. Well, as it loses energy, it means it no longer has the capacity to carry the heavier clasts. So what happens? It has to start depositing the sands because they're the biggest clast. So it deposits the sands first. Over time, the water slows down even more, so it loses even more energy. And eventually it doesn't have enough energy to carry the silt anymore, so it has to start depositing the silt. And then eventually the water comes to a near complete stop, so it has very, very little energy, at which point it will start depositing the clay. So you can see that the layer of rock is going to have a gradation going from sand at the bottom through to silt through to clay. And you're going to see this steady change in grain size as you come up through the layer. So if we look at this situation here, we can see we're going from a sandy unit at the bottom, which is marked out by this yellow brown layer. Then we're coming into this silty layer here, which is marked out by this dark gray material. And then we're finishing up in this quite fine light gray clay. And so you can see here from here, to here we essentially have a graded bed going from sandy sediment at the bottom to clay sized clasts at the top. And so this is the result of a, a steady change in energy of the system. We're starting off with a higher energy down here and over time the energy of the system is decreasing. And so that you know obviously results in a change in the grain size being deposited as the amount of energy changes. Okay thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.